Good morning, everybody. I, I believe it is still morning, so I can still be technically accurate and say that. Um, thanks for braving the snow and coming out to see us today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Safe Harbor, uh, which you heard the, the FTC commissioner, and you've heard a few times today, an agreement between the EU and the US that was implemented in 2000, received almost instant criticism from both groups in the EU and privacy groups in the US. Um, in 2013, the European Commission published 13 recommendations on what should happen with Safe Harbor in order to bring it more up to date and in line with privacy recommendations. Um, none of those recommendations were implemented. And then in 2015, Safe Harbor got struck down. And it got struck down because of this gentleman to my right. This is Max Schrems. Uh, Max is an activist in Europe, originally from Australia, and the founder of Europe. Austria, no kangaroos Facebook. in Australia. No, no, no kangaroos. kangaroos in Austria. <laughs> Did I say Australia? Yeah. yeah. Ooh, I'm so Austria. Yeah. Yes, I knew that. Um, Actually, and Facebook, the first time I made an access request, they sent my, the disk they should send to Austria, they actually sent it to Australia too. It was wonderful to see like the tracking thing, going like, oh, it goes all around the globe. <laughs> <laughs> in Australia, they send it back. I think probably they have the problem more often. So I'm in good company with making that horrible mistake. Um, Max, why don't you say a few words and introduce yourself to everybody? Oh, um, yeah, basically, where should I start? I study law at the University of Vienna. I'm a PhD student right now. Um, I started kind of getting more interested in privacy law because I think we have this issue that we have fundamental rights in Europe, um, but we're not enforcing them properly, which kind of gave us the situation that there is a lot of like law in the textbooks, but not really a lot implemented in reality. And I thought that was interesting to kind of poke around a little bit. Um, and the whole kind of thing, what we're talking about, the Safe Harbor case kind of came up because a couple of journalists called me at, after the Snowden thing came up if Facebook can actually you know, do that from a European law perspective. Like from a US law pr perspective, obviously they can, but since Facebook has 82% of its worldwide user base in Ireland for tax avoidant reasons, um, they, the question became kind of, was there, it's like, is this legal? And I was like, very likely not. But can you explain what this is when you're saying? like um, That they are basically forwarding the data to the US from Europe and then forwarding it further to the, or making it at least available to the NSA. And so the um, question was, is in this chain of, of people kind of handing the data over, um, is the European part actually allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of obvious that no, they aren't, but it took like probably half an hour to look in a, dex in a textbook to kind of point down the actual paragraph where it doesn't work. And that was kind of how the story came up. The interesting thing was, I, I thought this case is gonna last forever. Um, the interesting thing was a hot potato. So like the Irish Data Protection Commission was like, no, I don't want to deal with this. Um, then the Irish High Court was like, right for referring it to the European Court of Justice. So we kind of came to the Supreme Court of the European Union and back within two years, which was like a rather rapid procedure. <laughs> and yeah, is that enough of an introduction? That's great. <laughs> um, so the, the CJEU issued its opinion late last year and they didn't give there, it was a long opinion, there's a lot of detail in there, but they didn't give a ton of guidance on what would satisfy the court yeah. and what um, changes were necessary. So in your opinion, what is needed to minimally satisfy um, the CJU's opinion, and what do you think would be a major victory for you? Like, what would you take home as a, as a major win on this? That was my problem with the case. Like, typically, if I bring cases, I want to kind of also add a list of what, how can you solve the problem? Um, this, solve, this problem is too big to solve for Europe or for me as an individual or kind of, you know. Um, so I think what we got to do is focus on the cases where we can get a solution. That's basically all US companies that do not fall under any of these mass surveillance laws. Um, so we do have a lot of safe harbor companies that are not even subject to the FISA Act. And so the problem is actually not existent. The kind of um, safe harbor was struck down because parts of it do not work in practice, but we would have a bunch of companies that actually do not fall under any of these conflicting laws in the US. I think that's something where we could easily find a solution. Um, we have a much bigger problem with companies that do fall under what's perceived as mass surveillance laws. And there, I don't really see a solution coming up because we have pretty much two parties in the room. We have like the European Commission who is bound by the findings of the European Court of Justice. And we have the US side that pretty much is very unlikely to change these laws um, fundamentally. Um, so I don't really see a solution there. I'm probably going to have something on the paper that mm -hmm. is not going to be very satisfactory. So we could possibly have a safe harbor that has a carve out for any company that falls under these laws. But then the Googles and Facebook would still end up not really having a safe harbor because any national data protection authority in Europe could then say, okay, there is an exception from it for companies that fall under mass surveillance laws in the US. 
So it doesn't apply to you, so you can't really work, use safe harbor. The same thing is actually true for the standard contractual clauses a lot of companies are using right now. There is an exception for cases of national law that conflict with them, which the Googles and Facebooks all ignore and kind of pretend there is actually no problem because we have standard contractual clauses, when actually all these decisions have an exception for these cases. So I think this basic conflict of fundamental rights in Europe, and the, especially the European Court of Justice, has been hugely strict on mass surveillance. Also in European cases, like the data retention case, um, I don't really see where this conflict is so easy to solve. And that's my problem with the case, because I would love to kind of walk up and say, you know, there's an easy solution, we can fix it this way. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't. So, so far we have mainly been at a, someone pointed it out as like the story with the emperor without clothes. Everybody knew there's a problem, but kind of everybody pretended it's not there. And suddenly you're like the kid saying, he's naked. And um, that's basically, I think, what happened. So when you talk about US mass surveillance law, the case was brought under, um, Section 702 of the FISA Act. Yeah, we mainly Act. relied on 702, but we didn't only rely on it. We always brought that up as an example. Um, so that's basically what, that was basically the prison thing that we brought as an example of why this is not working. Okay, so you're talking about all mass surveillance law in the we, U.S., potentially. I, as a lawyer, I tried to concentrate on one thing and really know enough about this, um, but we kind of tried to get the other things into the debate as well by saying, as an example, we have this one article here. So I'm going to challenge you just a little bit. Sure. Um, so the funny thing about US surveillance law is that it's actually easier to conduct surveillance when you're collecting information outside of the United States. Right. So presumably by bringing a case that would make information stay in Europe, you're actually making the NSA's job a lot easier um, because the information no longer comes to the US. So rather than falling under um, Section 702 or other court overseen programs, it could actually, data could be collected under Executive Order 12333, um, which is an executive order um, yeah. issued under President Reagan, doesn't really have a lot of oversight, has no court involvement at all. Um, do you think this actually conflicts with what you were trying to do by the, making that? The basic problem we have is jurisdiction. So um, the whole st um, story started that we had like this whole idea of mass surveillance, blah, 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 the whole debate. So we had like Merkel sending her angry letter. We all know that this is not gonna lead anywhere. So I was looking for cases where there's actually jurisdiction and we have jurisdiction in mass surveillance cases. You typically have a private actor collecting all the data, then forwarding it or making it available to the, to the government. So in these cases, you would have jurisdiction over the Facebook entity that actually would keep data in Europe if they do. I don't think it's a solution for Facebook. It's a solution for the Microsoft Cloud, for example. Um, but in these cases, the question is going to be where is factual access that, and, and where, like, which entities have factual access over it. So what Mac Microsoft was proposing, for example, that they give the data factually to Deutsche Telekom so they don't have factual access to it anymore. And if you have proper security in place so that the NSA cannot just suck it all up, then you would actually have a solution because it's just technically impossible. Um, that's a question of really security, not as much as you know, data protection as in law. Um, so I think there, this could be a solution. However, I was always saying this is just one case to bring up. That's like one little element to say, you know, we have a problem here. Um, it's not going to solve the whole surveillance debate we have at all. Um, it's just like one kind of thing where you can start getting the debate running because I think what we had is, was a lot of outrage and a lot of debate, but there was not really a lot of consequences. And that was more the idea of the case, not necessarily to solve the whole issue. I never so, claimed that. <laughs> and that has been a, a criticism that we've heard in the US, um, that really in the EU, I mean, you look at countries in the EU, even UK. Germany, you look yeah. at the UK, yeah. um, their Draft Investigatory Powers Act that's being considered right now, which has many people quite mm. worried, um, not only because of the very invasive surveillance that they're proposing, but they're proposing it with an extraterritorial effect, right. which means it would apply basically every, everywhere around the world. Um, turning to the US on surveillance is actually a very small piece of the surveillance problem. We're probably more well-funded than most of the other countries on our surveillance programs, but the, the programs that we seek and authorize are about the same level of invasiveness. Um, how would so you respond to that criticism? Argument, basically. Um, I think that is, that is interesting because a lot of people don't understand the difference in jurisdiction in Europe. Um, the European Union doesn't have any jurisdiction over national surveillance or national security in general. So what the member states are doing is absolutely up to them. There is no, no jurisdiction that the European Court of Justice has. It's pretty much, if you think from a, U a US perspective, as if Texas does something wrong, you can't blame the federal government if they just don't have any jurisdiction over it. Just like 100 years ago, the um, Bill of Rights didn't apply to the states. 
if they just did some crazy thing, you couldn't blame the um, this federal government for it. And that's the problem we have in Europe right now, is that we have individual member states doing things that are the same or worse, um, but you can't blame the European Court of Justice for having issues within Europe as well. So the argument that comes around now is a lot of, oh, they just do the same thing overall, so we're basically um, good again, which basically is not, like the, 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 the argument doesn't wor uh, work out because and whenever a com commercial entity is engaged, you do have European Union law um, applying, to, applying to them. So in the case of Facebook Island, for example, or Google in, I think they're an island too, or someone like Microsoft is in Luxembourg or whatever it is, um, whenever they share data with the government, the European Union law does apply to them. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this kind of um, different situations. Whenever you have a private actor engaged, you have European Union law that holds you to a higher standard that your national law probably applies. And that's a, a, that's a tricky situation. That's the reason I also try to kind of highlight this is not a kind of anti-US case. It's an anti-mass surveillance case, which of course in Europe and worldwide didn't work out too well because there's like this, you know, US versus Europe debate. Um, but to me, it was like I was more hoping that this case will go down to stress because within Europe, when it comes to national surveillance, the relevant court is the uh, European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg. And we just had cases coming out of this court um, against Russia and Hungary that were basically saying the same thing. The Hungarian case in the concurring opinion is even referring to my case at the European Court of Justice. And I think we'll see the same thing happening there in Europe. And I hope we can solve the problems within Europe. Um, and there are remedies, there is Strasbourg, and we see the cases winding up right now after the Snowden, um, um, the Snowden disclosures. Um, it's just not there so far. And I think that's probably the answer that you have to look at the different jurisdictions we have and where you know, issues come out. If um, you look at the European Court of Justice, I think the criticism is totally wrong because they even overturned data retention, which is basically the Verizon phone tapping debate that, that was there in the US where the solution, like uh, keeping the data with Verizon or whatever the phone companies, um, which is seen as like the privacy friendly solution in the US right now, was something that was overturned by the European Court of Justice. Well, so the US also actually knocked down data retention. There was a right. proposal um, in the USA Freedom Act, which was the, the NSA surveillance reform bill that passed last year. Um, there was this threat of data retention being inserted into it at the last minute. And mm. the companies and civil society and lawmakers said, absolutely yeah. not. Uh, um, and so there is no data retention in the U.S., which is, was a victory. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we are, we're seeing it come back in the U.K. We saw uh, it pass and we have the same problem, again. especially on jurisdiction. You see exactly this issue. The European Court of Justice struck down the national law. So, for example, Austria got rid of the law because we never wanted it. Basically, our government didn't want it. But um, countries like in Ireland, they're still mm -hmm. debating it because now where there is no EU law on it, there is no European Union jurisdiction on the matter anymore. So it's up to the member states to do yes. their retention or not. And that's just the, the, the way the European Union works, unfortunately, oftentimes, but that's the fact, that's the problem. So we're gonna open it up to audience questions in just a minute. One final question. Um, so negotiations should be wrapping up soon um, for Safe Harbor 2. Um, we've heard there is a deadline that is um, imminently looming on when a new agreement would have to be in place. Um, in your ideal world, if that gets resolved, where do you go next? And whatever solutions that you put forward, do you think some of these, there's been um, debate that this has actually a disproportionate impact on small companies, companies that don't already have these alternative mechanisms in place, the model contract clauses, um, companies who really need the safe harbor agreement, I think, mm. to be able to operate. Um, so how would you reconcile that impact? Uh, I, I hate the whole debate about the small companies because every time it's kind of the big companies coming in, it's like, we really just lobby for the small companies, not for us. And I had the feeling that was the response here too. Um, most of the smaller companies, as, as far as I can see in practice, have a much easier time to move something to another like European provider. It's much harder to be Facebook and split your own service in two. That's like a, much, you know, a, a whole different ballgame. And so I don't really see that there is like really this huge issue for small companies. I think what we have to do in Europe is to get rid of the standard contractual clause system, but probably go to multilateral system where you can have standard contractual terms, for example, to put in your terms as a company, which basically is what Safe Harbor has been, um, and not need to sign contracts in each case, which makes it much easier for small companies to just say, okay, they have like these things in their terms, so I'm safe. Um, but none of these is gonna, you know, be a solution to mass surveillance in general when they fall under the law. So we still have, we'll have this issue. 
Um, I don't really see how this can be solved anyways, but um, I'm, I'm hopeful that there is at least a solution for companies that do not fall under it, because there are a bunch of companies that never did anything wrong, and they kind of got hit with the safe harbor decision on the way. Um, generally on the enforcement, I'm wondering how it's going to work out, because I mean, we all know that, for example, the Irish Data Protection Authority is never going to issue an enforcement notice against Facebook. They'd rather die. <laughs> and so we have other um, authorities like in Germany that to, to, do take this very seriously. They've already reached out to companies and said, you know, do you have your email with Gmail? Do you have your stuff on, I don't know, some Microsoft cloud? Um, have already reached out to the companies and said, you know, you can't do that anymore under the law. So we'll see this split in member states as well because it's still 28 individual countries with individual cultures oftentimes. Um, and we'll see how these different authorities are, are going about it. Uh, I don't think that anyone is going to be hit with the crazy big fine, but there are a lot of companies that will be pushed to rethink where their data is going. And um, honestly, a lot of companies in Europe knew that this is a risky thing. They just thought, okay, having all my emails on Gmail is just cheaper, to, cheaper than running my own server. And that's why they kind of took the risk and probably now rethink it. And yeah. So granted, we just spoke about the surveillance problem in Europe. There's really mm. a surveillance problem everywhere. If you were a company, where would you keep your data? <laughs> <laughs> I think you really got to look for each case. What's, what's your trade partners? Who, who do you want to, you know, what, what do you want to protect against? Which kind of data do you have? It's complicated. I mean, for example, in Austria, we don't have any kind of mass surveillance law at all. And we have a constitutional court that struck down like even data retention with, with a lot of, you know, with a really broad judgment or something like that. So you probably want to look like, at countries like these that have a very stable constitutional system that are not probably smaller countries oftentimes that don't even have to have the cap capabilities like Austria would be not able to do that being a really small country. Um, that's probably the places you want to go for these things. Um, but you always have to look at your system. Like if you are a cloud provider, you can probably split your cloud to a certain extent. If you are, however, Facebook that wants to run the worldwide service, it has to be interconnected somehow. So you're kind mm -hmm. of in a situation where you don't have these options. So I, think, I think it's hard to kind of you know, say that's the one solution for everybody. So I know that I know that there are questions <laughs> in the audience. Um, I just ask that you try to keep it short so we can get to as many people as possible and actually end with a question and not with a, a period. <laughs> um, so there are a couple people over here. Thanks, Amy. Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. And the EU court in this ruling, Max, didn't look at the spying in Europe relative to the USA when considering equivalence. But the next legal challenge of Safe Harbor 2.0 probably should, especially given what Amy said about the increased, recently increased surveillance among EU governments. And I think you initially dismissed Amy's question as the hypocrisy argument, but then you went on to answer the, the jujitsu jurisdictional problem mm -hmm. with respect to the ECJ. And then I heard you acknowledge that the ECJ does have jurisdiction if private companies in Europe are sharing data that is subject to surveillance by those European countries. So here's the question. Are you planning to bring some actions against those European country surveillance measures when they affect the data of Europeans that is routed through those country servers. There is a, um, on the jurisdiction in this case, there is, it's Article 13 in the, in the regulation, that's the issue, and there is a debate if this actually applies in like a national context as well. And that would be a very interesting case to bring, I would love to bring it. Um, if, you know, if someone wants to do donate 100,000 euro, I'm all happy to bring it. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's not too easy to ask from an individual student that does that in his free time to bring every privacy case ever in Europe. So I think there are a lot of people that could possibly do that just as well. And um, I'm happy to, to aid it and help it. And I was hoping that this judgment will go down for European surveillance just as well. That's what I said the whole day when the judgment came out, is I hope it's going to be having an impact within Europe as well. And I do think it does. Um, we see exactly the Strasbourg co uh, court going the same direction, and it will be very interesting, the case coming out from the, up from the UK right now, the Big Brother Watch thing, to see how that is turning out. And I, I would bet a lot of money on having them see struck it down. Um, but that's just, you know, it takes a while. It's, this was the first big case, basically, but we'll see more cases coming up. And um, the big problem with Strasbourg is that you have to exhaust all the local remedies first, so all these cases are stuck in the member states for a while. Typically, these member states are not overturning their own rules. Then it goes up to Strasbourg, and then you finally have the ruling, and then you have Cameron saying, oh, if they rule this way, we're not members of the European Convention of Human Rights anymore. And you get in this whole debate. Um, but, you know, it takes time, and um, I, can, you know, I can do as much as I can do as a, a single person working from home. 
Um, and I think for that, I did you know, a decent job. <laughs> Do we want to go back to Mike? Mike Nelson with Cloudflare. Uh, I was in Europe last week, and I was su surprised with just how pervasive the idea that politicians just aren't going to stand up for privacy anymore because of the Paris attacks. Mm. There was just a sense that the people aren't demanding more privacy, they're demanding protection from terrorists. I want to commend you and Amy for getting SOTN16 to be trending here in DC. <laughs> I also want to commend you for the Snowden snowman that you put in front of the White House this I weekend, <laughs> which is part of the reason we're trending. Do you have any other creative ideas on how to change the debate in Europe? Because right now, all I hear is we're worried about terrorism, the intelligence agencies are going to do what they want. I think it's much broader in Europe, the problem we have right now. Um, we have the whole issue with the refugee crisis. There is a general mood of everything is going down the drain right now. And um, in this situation, you know, privacy is not really the first topic. And um, I was even within the European Parliament when they debated the um, uh, passenger name record thing. And a member of Parliament told me, I know that I have to vote for this because otherwise I'm all over the news not doing anything about, against terrorists. But please ask someone to go against it because I think the, the bill I'm actually voting for right now is not constitutional. And this is kind of the awkward situation we partly have is that there is just this public pressure for a lot of these things whenever, I, I mean, Paris was crazy. If you compare it to terrorist attack we had, it's not as big of a deal, but France went totally ballistic saying we're not, you know, um, following the European Convention of Human Rights anymore, stuff like that, which if you compare it to like the terrorist threats we had in the 70s or 80s, um, it's like absolutely insane what is going on. And I think a big part of it is the media that constantly wants to have like, you know, the back next break in news and the next, you know, end of the world. Um, and that's a general trend we have in Europe with a lot of things, and I'm, I'm very worried about these, these issues, but I think it goes far beyond just you know, the Paris situation right now that will probably not be something we talk about in, in a year anymore, but the general feeling in Europe is very crazy, I, my personal perception right now. But yeah, that's you know, influencing Final all these debates in a way. question up here. Hi, uh, I'm Molly McPherson with Access Partnership. Um, I'm very intrigued by this concept of uh, separating out companies in the U.S. who are affected or, or are under surveillance law and who are not. Where would you draw the line there? How would you define that? I mean, is this just companies that aren't known to be participating in any sort of surveillance assistance to the U.S. The thing government? is already going to fall under the law. So Europe is going to not going to look at the factual access, but the question, are you falling under any of these national surveillance laws? Um, you can make the argument that you got to think about the possibility that there is actual access, um, but very likely a legal case will be very good just saying they are, and in the, in, the, in the case of the, uh, the FISA, like the 702 thing, you have to be an electronic communication service provider. And that is defined under the law, so you can say, are you an electronic communication service provider or are you not? Um, so that's going to be the question, I think, that will be asked, and that will also be the relevant question for standard contractual clauses. So anybody that is now using standard contractual clauses should really kind of get a list of U.S. law that applies to them that could possibly conflict with European Union law. If you're the average hotel chain that just wants to exchange human resource data, you're not going to have any problem um, with standard contractual clauses. If you're Google and you're sending out emails to everybody saying, oh, we have standard contractual clauses, it's all fine, then you probably have an issue not just on the legal side, but also on the contract side with your contract partners because they're going to say, what you told us is not what the law says, actually. Um, so I think that's what you got to look at. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting that is probably relevant for debate here is that the charter is very broad in the application. So you have a right in privacy already that your data is accessible or it's made available, that's the original wording. So just the fact that Facebook has to make my data available is good enough to get my Article 8 rights engaged, which is a very broad understanding compared to like the Fourth Amendment. And that is something that a lot of people have not really fully understood because um, there was oftentimes the argument, okay, Schrems never showed that his data was actually accessed by the NSA. Under the law in Europe, I don't have to. I just have to say they have to make the data available. And that's all I have to do. And so that's a, we have a very broad understanding of these protections because typically otherwise you're not, allowed to, uh, you're not able to prove that you actually were so under surveillance. 
Um, so you have to get a very broad understanding of these laws to see, am I actually falling under any of these or could someone make the argument I do? And already then you probably have, you know, you should probably at least take a look at it. So um, Tim's going to come up with some housekeeping issues um, before we break for lunch. Thank you all. Uh, Max has said that he's going to be sticking around for 30 minutes. So if you have questions you didn't get to ask, feel free to corner him um, near the lunch buffet. Um, and thank you, Tim. Thanks. <laughs>